Hey everyone, I'm Harpreet Sahota, hacker in residence at Voxel 51, and I'm joined by my co-host, Jacob Marks. He's a research scientist at Voxel 51. Today we have the honor of hosting Hugo Laurenson about his paper, What Matters When Building Vision Language Models, which was accepted into NeuroIPS 2024. Vision language models, or VLMs for short, are rapidly evolving, but their design often involves decisions that lack a lot of experimental justification. So this makes it difficult to know what choices really contribute to a model's performance. To address this, Hugo and his co-authors conducted extensive research to explore the design space of VLMs. They examine areas like model architecture, training methods, and the impact of different components on inference efficiency. And through their research, they developed a model called IDEFIX2, which is a 8 billion parameter VLM that has achieved state-of-the-art performance in its size category and actually even rivals models that are four times its size. The paper also discusses the importance of language model backbones, the advantages of the fully autoregressive architecture, as well as strategies for improving model efficiency. Hope you're excited as I am to learn about the development of IDEFX2, its training process, and how it stacks up against other leading vision language models. Hugo, the floor is yours. Take it away. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. So in this presentation, I will talk about the work we have been doing at Regging Face, trying to understand how to build these vision language models. So first thing, what is a vision language model? So we will say that it's a model that takes as input text and images and that outputs text. So the most famous ones are GPT-4, GPT-4O, and there are also Gemini, Cloud3. So with VLMs, you can do a lot of things. So for example, you could imagine prompting a VLM with the screenshot of a website and asking the model to generate the code to recreate the website. Or you could prompt it with an exam with text and formulas, diagrams, figures on it. And the model can answer the questions directly from the scan PDF. So you can do a lot of things. And we were interested in making a foundation vision language model. So a model that is generalist and not just specialized on one task. And also we put a lot of focus on being efficient at inference and also efficient during the, the training. So at that time, there was still a, a lot of open questions around how to make a good uh, vision language models. And especially there was one question about the architecture. So there was this um, cross attention architecture introduced in the paper Flamingo, where the authors essentially took the vision encoder and passed it and passed the output of it to the language model via cross attention. So yeah, just one thing I, I forgot to mention is that usually when we build a vision language models, we start from, we start with two backbones that are already pre-trained. So one language model and one vision encoder, and we are trying to connect them together with a newly added parameters. So in Flamingo, they use cross attention for that, or you can do something much simpler is simply taking the output of the vision encoder. And after just a modality projection, so it's essentially just, it can be as simple as a linear layer to match the output dimension of the vision encoder to the input dimension of the language model. And that can be as simple as that to, uh, to make the connection. Uh, then you also have a potentially pooling strategy to reduce the number of visual tokens per image and try to have an architecture that is a bit more efficient at inference and during the training. And I will uh, talk about this just after. But these are the two main lectures that uh, people are using. So we were uh, trying to understand which one performs the best. So it's uh, important to notice that the cross-attention architecture has more uh, parameters, more learnable parameters. And when the backbones are frozen, we found that it performs better. However, when you train the backbones, we found that the self-attention uh, architecture performs better than the cross-attention one, despite having fewer learnable parameters. We also had instabilities during the training, during the pre-training, uh, when we tried to unfreeze the language model and the vision encoder. So what we did is we used LoRa directly in the pre-training and it uh, stabilized the, the training. There was also a, an open question about the importance of the pre-trained backbones on the final performance of the VLM. And uh, the, the conclusion is that if your uh, backbones to so the language model and the vision encoder are not well-trained, you will have a bottleneck in the end. Like for example, we tried replacing Lama 1 by Misral and we obtained a big boost. 
and uh, it's the same with the different vision encoders. And now we come to the, the trying to make the model more efficient at uh, inference. So for this, we tried to reduce the number of visual tokens per image because it might not be necessary for all tasks. And what we did, we tried several uh, pooling strategies and uh, we found that what worked best for us was using a perceiver resampler. So a perceiver resampler is a learned pooling strategy in the sense that it contains learnable parameters. So it's not like a max pooling, for example. We tried this uh, approach and it didn't work so well for us. And with a learned uh, pooling uh, strategy, we see that uh, we can reduce uh, the um, number of visual tokens to something as uh, low as uh, 64 without really damaging the performance on uh, non-OCR tasks. So that's what we used in the end, only the 64 tokens to encode uh, each image. We also try to preserve the aspect ratio of the images so that this way we don't resize all the images to squares like it was mostly done uh, before. We keep the aspect uh, and pass the patches directly to the model. So what is good is that when you have a low, lower resolution image, then uh, you spend less compute uh, at inference than uh, if you had to uh, scale it to a square. There is also this technique called uh, image splitting that is now very popular. Is essentially you try to spend more compute at inference on an image. So you have, imagine that you have an image that has a high resolution. So what you could do is split it into several sub images and encode each of these images with the vision encoder and then pass uh, the, this whole sequence as input to the language model. So the, the result of that is that you will uh, end up with uh, many more uh, visual tokens. And uh, we try to see uh, if, uh, if this is useful and when it's useful. And what we saw is that it's mostly useful for tasks requiring reading uh, text in an image. So for example, DocVQA and TextVQA, but not really useful for the other ones. So what is really good is that if during your training, you train with and without, you have example with and without this image splitting strategy, then at inference, you can choose between spending more compute if you want to be good at reading text in an image or spending less compute if you don't mind about this or if your task is not about this. Then moving on to the data, so we train uh, during the pre-training mostly on interleaved uh, image text documents. So this is our data set that we created before, Obelix. And also uh, it's important to have uh, image text pairs for a faster convergence. It's important to have both. So for the image text pairs, we use Lion Coco. And what is important to notice is that we only use synthetic captions because we saw that it performs, it performs better in practice. And that very often the original alt text of, of these image uh, data sets that are crawled from the web are really poor. So that's, that explains why uh, synthetic uh, captions works uh, better for that. We also used CR data sets, so PDFA and uh, IDL, and approximately uh, 10 million of uh, scanned uh, PDF. And the task for the language model for the VLM was simply ta uh, taking as input this scanned PD this scan PDF and uh, outputting the text. So it's good to uh, teach the model how to, how to read a, a long document. And eventually, at that time, there was not a lot of, of instruction fine-tuning data sets. And in the literature, we found, after doing a, a big literature review, we found a lot of many interesting data sets, like academic data sets, for example, that are, each of them are not huge in size, but if you process and concat them all, then you start to have a, a data set with a significant size and that is of uh, good quality because for some of these data sets, a lot of them actually, the answers are written by, by a human. So you know that it's, that it's true. And this is what we did with the cold run. So we created a concatenation of 50 data sets taken from the literature and we also processed, processed these data sets uh, to have a unified format. And then we cover a lot of uh, different uh, tasks uh, during the fine tuning. And this way you can, uh, you can teach the model to, uh, to be very general and answer, for example, a question about uh, trying to uh, quantities in a table and uh, perform and perform a calculation uh, based on that. So that's, uh, that's my presentation.
Thank you. Awesome, Hugo. Thank you so much. Appreciate the presentation here. I've got some key questions lined up for you myself, but the first one, I'll just turn it over to Jacob here to see if Jacob has uh, any questions okay. he'd like to ask. Thanks, Harpreet. And thanks, Hugo, for the incredible presentation. Harpreet and I and everybody at Vox51 are just huge fans of Hugging Face and the work that you guys do. And in particular, Itifix is incredible. Itifix 1, Itifix 2, everything that you guys are doing in, in, that, in that realm. Um, a few particular questions definitely came to mind. So the first one is you mentioned that image splitting seemed to give better results for uh, images that have text in them as opposed to just sending in a low resolution uh, image. And that kind of makes sense because the text features are probably very small. There's a lot of fine granularity. Did you happen to see other things like that where there were other like visual cases that were not text related that had better performance for the image splitting? Not really. It was mostly, uh, yes, document understanding, chart understanding. So either images with a really high uh, resolution that you need to maybe split into, into smaller images or images with a lot of text uh, on it. But uh, for example, for the captioning task, I don't think this is really useful. Gotcha, gotcha. And then another thing that caught my eye was pretty early on in the presentation, you mentioned that there was a comparison between cross-attention and self-attention backbones for these models. And it was a little bit surprising to me that when you unfroze the backbone, the self-attention model ended up having better performance. Do you have any intuition for why that might be? So you are surprised because it contains uh, fewer parameters, right? Yeah, and you know, less interactivity, I would guess. I don't know. I had an explanation at some point, but I, I forgot the intuition. Yeah, sorry. That's totally fine. Totally fine. If you happen to remember it, I'm very curious to let me know. Maybe it's okay. a bit, uh, overall, I think it's a, this cross-attention architecture is a bit complex. Complex and hard to understand. And you have this language model that is already pre-trained, that is super good. And then you break it by inserting a cross-attention layer, like within each layer of the language model. So maybe it, it's, it perturbates the original performance of the language model. Maybe that can be an explanation. While for the self-attention architecture, the vision, like the language model is, is preserved. And what is good with the self-attention architecture is then even if we train, we end up training this language model and the vision encoder to obtain a better performance, you could only train the connection between the vision encoder and the language model. Like really, it's, it's just, for example, one single layer, one linear layer, and it still works. So even if you train probably something like 10 million trainable parameters, it's, you still have a model that works in the end. While it is not the case for the cross-attention architecture. Awesome. Thanks, Jacob. Hugo, my question is mostly around the data that was used to, you know, tr train the model here. You talked about using synthetic captions from the Lion Coco. And I guess this is based on the assumption maybe that these captions are higher quality than the original alt text captions. I'm wondering, like, did you have to do any type of analysis to address or assess any type of potential bias or limitations introduced by the model used to generate the captions? Like, for example, could the captioning model maybe show biases towards like particular objects or scenes or visual concepts that maybe might not represent kind of the diversity that we see in real world images? And, you know, well, how could this potentially propagate to the ADEFX model? Yeah, I think this is a really great question and super, super important because now more and more models are trained on synthetic data and synthetic data only sometimes. And, and uh, so the, this Lion Coco data set was created with, with a Blip2 model that is not, I mean, not the best right now. And of course, we can imagine creating a better image text pair, uh, text pair data set. I think the Lion Coco was created by prompting Blip with the original uh, alt text and also the, like the, what it will uh, generate. So in this sense, you also have like uh, of the original alt text. So maybe that can definitely help, like for example, to identify celebrities or things like this. Yeah, I think it's important to, to reformulate the original alt text rather than completely come up with a new one all the time. And uh, yes, there are, we saw some works where they, where they used better, better models to generate the caption and eventually they end up with a better model. So it's kind of an iterative loop where you develop better models 
And then these models are trained, are used to develop uh, better synthetic uh, captions that are then used to create better models and so on. But yeah, there is definitely a risk of biases. Like, as you're saying that, there's like the image of that snake eating its uh, tail kind of <laughs> in a circle there. Yeah. Uh, happening that, that kind of flashed in my head there. Something you noted was the challenge of freshness of data and this issue of inclusion of newly opted out content in, in future model iterations. I'm wondering kind of what mechanisms or processes are being considered to monitor the training data for this newly opted out content, or maybe content that might become sensitive or, you know, the, the world changes, culture changes. So some things might become inappropriate over time. Do you think this is like uh, maybe differential privacy, federated learning or something like that could play a role in addressing these types of issues? So for this, we only, like for the opted out uh, content, we only use the spawning. Uh, so it's simply an API where you, you send all of the URLs of your documents and your images, and they check for you if the, con if the creator decided to opt out the content. So in this case, when it was the case, we removed the data set from the, from uh, our, from uh, our training. That's mostly what we did. And also we tried to have filters for not say for our content to remove or to reduce the proportion of porn in the data because it's kind of overrepresented on the uh, web data set. So we did that for Obelix too. That's mostly what we did for the ethical part, I would say. Awesome. Thank you. You also mentioned, of course, like, you know, the evaluating, you know, IDFX2 on these established benchmarks, but I'm wondering like if you perhaps explored any other methods for evaluating the impact of data quality and curation on kind of more nuanced aspects of the model's behavior, right? And, you know, like practitioners that are trying to take the model and, and use it, they might want to use it to do maybe generate creative or imaginative responses. Maybe they want to be sensitive to cultural differences in some visual context, or, or maybe they want it to be kind of less susceptible to adversarial examples or data poisoning kind of attacks. I'm wondering, you know, if you have any tips for people that are looking to use the model for kind of evaluating it for their own use case rather than kind of benchmarks? Yeah, I think it's a good question. And usually I think the, the key is to build a demo for uh, your model and test it as much as possible to try to understand the fa failure cases, what it does right and what it does wrong. And it was especially important for us when we developed the, when we created the data set Obelix, because so we... For example, we made a first version of the data set, then we trained a model on it. And then we started to notice that at the end of the sentences, the model will uh, tend to generate something like uh, uh, share on Twitter, uh, post on Facebook, uh, blah, blah, blah. And this is simply because this was not removed for, from the training data. So then just by observing the, the output of the model, uh, you might understand that you need more filtering steps or also that you might that you miss instruction uh, data sets on a certain task. Uh, yeah, so definitely building a demo, playing with the model, and try to have a better uh, understanding of what it does right. And Good old fashioned uh, vibe checking, right? <laughs> that still is super <laughs> important. That's it for me, Jacob. Any other questions or anything from your end? That's it for me. I love that anecdote about the sharing on socials. And I'm sure Harpreet's going to end this with telling everybody to share this on socials and share your paper on socials and everything like that. But it's really been great to hear about your work from the source and to get to ask you questions. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank so you. Yeah, the thank you. Thank you again for being here. And if you do find yourself in Vancouver for near Ips, I, I hope you are there. Please come say hi to us at the Voxel 51 booth, man. I'd love to kind of hook you up with some swag. And uh, yeah, just, that, that uh, would be nice. You. I think I'm going here. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. It would be very nice. Awesome. Well, thank you very much and appreciate you taking time to join us today. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Have a good one.